impacts your immune system. Reunited, this Deer Lake bound dog is found in Hamilton after being put on the wrong plane. Awesome, good news there. And some good news in the weather department in the long range. You gotta get through this weekend, which looks a little cool, a little unsettled. The details are coming up. Our top story tonight, Richard Gillett is not backing down. Despite speaking with the federal fisheries minister last night, Gillett is continuing his hunger strike. And he is getting more support on site. Just a few hours ago, protesters prevented employees from leaving DFO in St. John's. And that's where here in us, Glenn Payette is right now. So Glenn, what's the latest? Well, the latest is that backlog of traffic is now cleared up. This afternoon around 3 o'clock, it went from where we're standing all the way up here to the DFO building. That's probably about a half a kilometer or so. Now, the protesters stopped the cars for a while, then it began letting them go through 15, one every 15 minutes, and eventually let them start to flow through very slowly, but the whole thing was cleared up around 5.30. Now, the man at the center of this, Richard Gillette, a fisherman from Twillingate who has heart condition and diabetes and his health is fading, is in the tent here behind me, the one with the green tarp. Now, he spoke last night with fisheries, well, not fisheries minister, but the minister in charge of fisheries, Dominic LeBlanc. Now, G Gillette says that LeBlanc didn't give him any concrete promises, just the promise of a meeting uh, two or three weeks down the road. Now, what they're looking for is a full review of fisheries management and fisheries science and he says they didn't get a promise of that nothing to say about the review and I said mr. minister I said you know let's cut to the chase I'm not up for bullshit let's cut just cut for cut to the chase you know you know my demands and he wasn't willing at the time to to do any of that and I told him I wasn't willing to give in but I did warn the minister just tired I'm sorry I'm just a bit tired uh, it takes every bit of energy now just to talk uh, but I did warn the minister that Newfoundland and Labrador right now as it comes to the fishery the turmoil and everything that's going on she's a powder cake Jesus, I'm afraid it's going to end Gabriel with him you being in taken off this hill in an ambulance <laughs> oh, or worse. Jesus, I'm lucky. afraid of that. I don't know if they're willing to even consider what he's asking for. And that scares me. It's been so long. And they've seen for themselves how weak he is. They've seen it. Now this afternoon, senior police officers were in the tent with Mr. Gillett and I, Mr. Gillette, and I asked them at what point they would come in and remove him if his health faded to a certain point. And they said that really isn't up to them; it would be up to the health authorities. Now, as we mentioned, what this is all about is Gillett and the others want a full review of fisheries management and fisheries science. And this afternoon, DFO scientists had a technical briefing for journalists, and our Peter Cowan was there. Peter, what did you find out? Well, Glenn, basically they spent two hours laying out the science behind these cuts, and the scenario they presented isn't a good one. The ocean has warmed up, and that is bad news for the valuable crab and shrimp stocks. On top of that, the capelin stocks haven't rebounded. Well, why is that significant? Well, they described that species as the linchpin. That's the main food for cod, which we're all hoping is going to rebound so the fishery can increase there. But also, if the cod don't have capelin to eat, instead they're eating shrimp and crab, hurting those stocks even more. And what officials laid out today from both the management and the science side was that they believe that they're using the best science available to make these decisions. We do understand the, the reason why we're getting that kind of reaction, but this is, this is difficult stuff, and we are doing the very, very best that we can with the information that our science colleagues are able to provide to us, with the input of industry. Um, are we getting it 100% right? I don't know if we will ever know. They also laid out the fact that there is more investment in science within DFO. For example, they've got six new scientists who've been hired. They're pouring millions into better research for capelin and cod. And they said there's been a big change in the overall attitude of science since the Liberals have taken over. The mood went from sort of there to there um, by the change, by the attitude 
you know, the fact that science actually matters. It's part of the decision-making process. Whereas in the past, it was like, we, don't wanna, you know, we, we give the impression that we're going to listen to it, but they don't. Okay? And so now I would say that we're in a much better situation. Today, officials said that there is one area that they could do a lot better, and that's in communicating that science both to the public and to the people who are involved in this, the people who face these big cuts to their livelihood. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Well, after a long, strange plane trip that began in Halifax and should have ended in this province, Terry Pittman has finally found her lost Labradoodle, Cooper. And here's Cooper and his owners being reunited in Hamilton, Ontario this morning. After enduring torrential rains overnight, Cooper was found wet and hungry by a group of residents near the airport where he'd gone missing. Cooper was cold and scared, but otherwise in good condition. The dog was supposed to travel from Halifax to Deer Lake to be with Pittman's family while she and her roommate headed to Jamaica for a wedding. Instead, WestJet put Cooper on a flight bound for Hamilton. The dog bolted after it was let out of its cage. Well, a case in St. John's where an immigrant family's children were removed from their home with force by police has a group that helps refugees and immigrants calling for change. Jose Rivera says the cultural in insensitivity police and social workers showed while taking the children was unacceptable. He's reacting to a report about the case released by the province's child and youth advocate earlier this week. We hope that with the strength of this report, uh, the proposals that are in there that are quite clear uh, can be implemented uh, as soon as possible. Because uh, in the 15 years that I have been here in Newfoundland and the 12 years that I have been sitting as, as uh, executive director of REAC, I have seen very many, many cases of that nature. Um, and behind that, uh, there's a lot of uh, outgoing of families that feel that they are going to be next. People are living with many different types of cancers in this province, and today some doctors and patients in St. John's tried to raise awareness about a less common one, acute myeloid leukemia. Today is AML Awareness Day in the province, and some people gathered at the GEO Center to talk about the disease. AML is a cancer of the blood. The treatment is aggressive. The patient's immune system needs to be wiped out and then replaced using bone marrow from a donor. Hematologist Dr. Dave Jones and his patient and AML survivor Jeff Penton hope to help people understand more about the disease. If you had more people understanding and understanding what the patients have to go through, even though the numbers might be smaller, um, then hopefully we can get some more devoted resources and, uh, you know, for, for the program to try to make it better care in Newfoundland. So I think that's probably one of the bigger things. And I think too, like you were just sort of alluding to, if you knew someone else who went through it, if we could, if we could, you know, knowledge is power. So if you can educate more people, then maybe we could help more people like Jeff. There is a lot of people going through it and maybe some of these people don't know, have people to talk to or don't have the resources there to, to avail of, right? So it's, uh, it's something definitely to, to, to make people aware. We also talked to Jeff Penton about what it was like to have AML and beat it. He'll tell us his story in 25 minutes. Well, Canadian Blood Services is axing three mobile clinics. It will no longer visit Mount Pearl, Torbay and the Goulds neighborhood of St. John's. It hasn't been connecting enough, collecting enough blood to make it worth the four to six trips a year. Instead, it's encouraging those donors to use its permanent clinic in St. John's. I know, it, you know, for some folks it certainly would be more convenient if the mobile was coming to Torbay, the Goulds are Mount Pearl, but this will, those donors we're hoping that we'll be able to convert them over to the Wicklow Street site, which is open five days a week, 52 weeks a year. Here's the scene a few hours ago, about 40 minutes outside Port of Basque. A transport truck went over a guardrail in an area known as Overfalls Brook. Much of the truck was demolished, but the cargo of bags of topsoil and gardening equipment remained on the truck. Emergency workers used the jaws of life to get the driver out. He's now in hospital, but police tell us he was able to walk to the ambulance. There's no word yet on what happened. It was clear and the roads were dry at the time. 
There are fresh signs from Husky Energy tonight that another gravity based structure will be built in the province. The company is advertising to hire a site construction manager, a four year job based out of Argentia. That's where Husky plans to build a concrete platform for its long awaited West White Rose extension. The ad says the project is waiting on a final decision to proceed. The Hebron oil platform is expected to be towed to the offshore within weeks. It's believed two people held up this gas station in St. John's overnight. Police responded to an armed robbery at the Ultramar on Black Marsh Road around 3.30 a.m. The RNC says two men got away with some cash. There's no word on what kind of a weapon was used, but no one was injured. A man from St. John's is facing more than two dozen counts of tax fraud tonight. The result of an investigation by the Canada Revenue Agency. He also faces three criminal charges related to fraud and forgery. The agency claims he filed false tax returns in 2011 and 2012 for himself and also filed false claims for 25 other people. Uh, five years ago. He's accused of receiving fraudulent refunds of more than $85,000. He'll be in court at the end of May. Well, preparations are continuing for a brand new summer festival in Grand Falls, Windsor. This one is centered around food dishes like these. It's called the Perfectly Centered Culinary Festival. Some of the country's top chefs will be in town in August for an event the town hopes will become an annual festival. Organizers say it'll be a great opportunity for local people to learn from the country's cooking masters. Well, there's playoff hockey at mile one this weekend. The Ice Caps have been practicing this week, preparing for the first round best of five series against the Syracuse, Syracuse Crunch. Game one is tonight at 730 with game two scheduled for tomorrow night. It's possible these could be the last two home games for the AHL franchise as the team is moving to Quebec next season. Marijuana is certainly the talk right now, especially with it expected to be legal in Canada next year. After the break, we highlight some of the Q&A sessions CBCNL hosted today on Facebook.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Well, before we talk about the all important weekend weather, mm -hmm. how did the big charity game, hockey game, go last it night? It went great. Uh, we're a little outmatched, us uh, media <laughs> folks, against the, uh, the great, there are some great hockey players in the local police forces here. That was the RNC and the RCMP, That's right, was it? and uh, have a look at, uh, again, first, uh, Philippe Grenier, our Radio Canada reporter on the far left, myself, Paul Pickett, our editor, and yeah, we let Crow play too. <laughs> and uh, this is just one of our shifts here. Great play by Pickett there. There's Grenier, throws it up to me on the, uh, on the left side, but uh, kind of gave the puck away here and uh, it was back the other way in a hurry. They were a great team. So, well, they had us doing some, uh, some fun stuff for the kids as well. Nice. Uh, this was uh, doing the chicken dance. We didn't do very good at that as well. There's a lot of <laughs> random stuff going on there. So anyway, we put the, uh, the kids to work and they got us back in the game uh, here, which was great. Look at this little move by this guy behind the net, dangling. Comes out, oh. little wrap around. Oh, yeah. Ooh, nice. And the A cello. Gretzky kind of. Yeah, thing. exactly. Watch the celebration. <laughs> Wait for it. Nice. <laughs> So they got us back in the game, which was great. And it's always great fun. And of course, uh, lots of money raised for Tourette's Canada. A Children's Wish Foundation, uh, just to name two of, uh, of uh, many there. So a uh, great job. NL Police Curling Association puts the whole thing off every year, and it's a great event. What was the score? 13-10, <laughs> I think. But wow. I think... I think the they kids stopped. saved you. Yeah, the kids saved us, and I think they stopped counting at 13 for them. So, uh, but uh, always a great event, and uh, it seemed as though the fans had a great time as well. Nice, great. great. Uh, so, from that ice to this ice. Wow. Yeah, that's a bit of ice accretion going on. Uh, not a great day on clothes. <laughs> ice accretion. Yes, ice accretion, basically ice building up or glitter, as uh, some folks here. I'm just going to say, what's accretion? It's yeah. You know, glitter. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I'll, I'll I'll keep my meteorologist speak for for uh, me. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely. Arlene Yetman Benson in CBS. Uh, this was one of the spots. Paradise in CBS uh, in those onshore winds have really been getting a coating. Uh, you could definitely see in some of the higher elevation areas today the big difference between the high elevations and the places closer to the coastline where we didn't see quite as much ice accretion, Debbie. Uh, or glitter uh, <laughs> as we uh, look at that freezing rain warning that is still in effect for the metro region down the southern shore. Uh, we are looking at that continuing that freezing rain warning at least for the next few hours. Wouldn't be surprised if Environment Canada then changes this to a freezing drizzle warning as the precip tapers off to drizzle overnight but the freezing temperatures continue and still some icing possible through the overnight tonight and in through Saturday morning. Note the temperatures near the freezing mark along the northeast coast into central. Beautiful day today along the west and south coast of the island again away from those onshore winds even Labrador two to three degrees uh, today and not a bad day across most of the big land there are those northerly winds which have been blowing in uh, again that onshore flow keeping that icing a bit of a factor in uh, north facing coastlines as well. You can see some of that steadiest precip starting to depart. Still some lingering showers here, especially another band moving in from the uh, southern shore. This will eventually taper off through this evening into the overnight to some drizzle. We'll see uh, a cloudy day for tomorrow with some more freezing drizzle chances. And then we're going to be watching our next system rolling in as we move into Sunday. Uh, here's how it will play out in terms of your future tracker. Note again that freezing drizzle and rain through this evening, tapering off through the overnight. Note just the clouds tomorrow, but in those northerly onshore winds, we will continue to see the possibility of some freezing drizzle and drizzle and even a flurry or two not out of the question in central. Uh, temperatures anywhere from minus one to minus four to start the day on Saturday, minus four in through Labrador. Uh, and again, clouds cover dominating for most. I think we'll see a pretty nice start to the day though for the west coast and the south coast as we roll throughout your Saturday. Clouds again dominating with that chance of some onshore freezing drizzle and drizzle across the island. Even some flurry chances in there, especially for the southeast. Here comes our Sunday system and yes, some flurries, showers in the mix and wouldn't even rule out some light accumulation for places like central and the northeast. We'll talk about that in more detail and we'll talk about the warm up 
and there is some good news in the long range. Not just sun, but some double digit temps in my forecast. And, uh, so you want to stick around for that. There are your conditions for tomorrow. A great day for uh, getting some uh, cleaning or laundry done, perhaps in the east and northeast. Not a great day to be outside. Northerly winds and again, uh, the clouds dominating. We are going to be seeing temperatures near six degrees for the west coast and across the south coast. And again, a pretty cloudy day, but overall, uh, not a bad Saturday across most of Labrador. Sunday and beyond. Coming up, Debbie. Well, with marijuana set to be legalized in a little over a year, it is a topic that many people are talking about. Today, our Zach Gowdy hosted a Facebook Live question and answer session with Rory McGee. Now, he's a marketing researcher with Dig Insights in Toronto. They just released a study about marijuana consumption and public opinion. So Rory, tell us about this research. Tell us first of all about uh, what did the, give us the executive summary about Canadians' uh, uh, opinions and usage patterns when it comes to recreational marijuana. Absolutely, and just for the background for viewers and listeners, we interviewed 1,100 Canadians and 1,100 Americans. So it's a good sample size and it's a representative sample size of both countries. And what we wanted to find out is both the attitudes of whether people want marijuana legalized, the usage of marijuana, and then also how legalization would impact other industries. So that could be alcohol, that could be quick service restaurants or consumer packaged goods. In Canada, it was interesting that nearly one out of four Canadians said they had used marijuana in the past year. And there's, there's one out of five that are saying, hey, if it became legal, I might try it. And in some ways, the people that you would think would use it, such as millennials, uh, men, it, those really aren't surprising. They index higher on marijuana usage than you would, do, than you would think. In fact, 12% of men aged 18 to 34 in Canada use marijuana daily. Rory, I have a comment from a Facebook uh, viewer, Daryl Power, who says that no, he has got no interest in consuming marijuana, I guess, whether it becomes legal or, or, or should stay illegal. What does your research tell you about um, the people who, again, like Daryl Power, currently have no interest? Are they likely to be won over to become marijuana consumers simply because it is legally available? Not necessarily. In terms of usage, over half of Canadians, 57%, said, I haven't used marijuana in the past year, and even if it becomes legal, I'm not likely to try it. So there's still a strong contingent of people that, that are just not interested in it, and that's, that's absolutely okay. What we found, though, is that those people are not always necessarily opposed to legalization. In, in some ways, I think some of those people understand the benefits of moving this towards a regulated market where the government generates tax revenue from it and there's not an opportunity cost of police dollars being put into stopping this and not stopping potentially more damaging uh, criminal activity. Carolyn, certainly uh, a lot of unanswered questions surrounding the legalization of pot. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things uh, they also raised is, uh, will people drink less alcohol when marijuana becomes legal? And what are the ramif ramifications of that? So if you want to hear more of that discussion, head to our Facebook page for the full recording of today's Q&A session. And if you follow, uh, and if you click the follow button when you're there, you'll be notified when CBCNL is doing Facebook Live events. I didn't realize that. After the break, we ask a former Deputy Minister of Justice about the Supreme Court of Canada's decision to review the Churchill Falls contract.
As we reported yesterday, the Supreme Court of Canada has agreed to review the 1969 Churchill Falls contract, a contract that's delivered a windfall of more than $26 billion to Hydro-Quebec, compared to about $2 billion for this province. Despite many legal challenges, the courts have always sided with Quebec. Ron Penny is a lawyer and a former Deputy Minister of Justice with our provincial government. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, good afternoon, Debbie. So how significant is this development? Well, I was very surprised, pleased to, to hear the news that we, did, we were granted leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada because it's uh, very few cases that the Supreme Court of Canada takes on and they only take it on if there's a significant uh, legal issue involved. So obviously in this case they felt that was the case um, and we've gone through uh, efforts in the past when I was Deputy Minister of Justice to try to rectify the contract without success and failed at the Supreme Court of Canada and we may fail again but at least this gives us uh, some hope uh, that uh, finally we, we will see justice so that, uh, so that we can get back to the bargaining table with Quebec and negotiate a, a contract which is fair to both sides. Mm. Now the Supreme Court of Canada never uh, divulges the reasons for why they take on a case, yes. uh, but this time around um, the province is uh, using the good faith clause as their tool to make their case. There is a fairness provision under the Quebec Civil Code and it's never been tested in this way before. And I think that's probably what's attracted the Supreme Court of Canada to, to, to look at this issue and see if this could, um, we'll find out whether or not this would in fact apply to this contract. And if it does, it really enhances our bargaining position with Quebec and uh, it, it, can, it can really make a tremendous change in Newfoundland I mean, to our fiscal situation. Um, if we can have this contract rectified even going forward in the renewal clause, because in the renewal clause, the rate has actually gone down, which is just terrible. It's just so, it's so uh, inequitable to the mm -hmm. province. So if this is successful, and we'll cross our fingers and hope that it is, it will be just tremendous for the province. I'm just wondering what are the, uh, the possible decisions that the Supreme Court could make? Is there a range uh, that they could come down with? Yes, I mean, in something they might just take a narrow position and look and just basically interpret that clause and uh, they could say that it doesn't really apply to, to this particular case. So it, 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 could, it go, could go either ways. On the positive side, the possible, I mean, I'm being an optimist as I am, um, if they said that it did apply and then ordered us back to the bargaining table, now they're not going to write the contract for us, we would have to go back to the bargaining table in Quebec but no doubt they would set up guidelines that would have to be followed as part of the negotiations. And if that happened, it would be a game changer for this province. It would just be incredible. I, I noticed last year the uh, Quebec government said uh, they, they made an olive branch, I guess, presentation about bury the hatchet with this province if the province would drop uh, legal challenges. Do you think that they were then and are now worried about the Supreme Court having a look at this? I don't, there's actually two cases going on now. So that this particular case, which is before the Supreme Court of Canada, and there's another case uh, uh, trying to figure out what contract applies in the renewal clause, and they've mm -hmm. taken a position which is opposed to the province's position uh, that the contract changes. And that may have implications for Muskrat Falls in terms of the water oh, rights, okay. so that's very important as well. Uh, I'm pretty cynical about, uh, about getting a deal with Quebec unless we have some bargaining power. And you've said that you feel that this case being heard now does give us a bit of bargaining well, I think power. Well, I think for the first time, certainly over the next year and a half, Quebec will be uncertain as to what its legal position is. So I think that perhaps there is an opening during this period of time. So um, there's a danger in doing that because, but you're better off perhaps if, if we can get a deal with them now based on their perception of the risk that they face. Um, they may well, may well be willing to come to the bargaining table. And if we can get this other issue to do with water rights and so on tucked away and the, what, what the provisions are with respect to what power they get and when they get it under the renewal clause, that would be very important. It is important for Muskrat Falls as well. So mm. there, is, there is a possible opening. But in the long, the long one, I mean, what you may, and this is a really important political decision, 
what you may do is, is take your chances and say, no, we're not going to sit down at the bargaining table until we know what our, our legal position is in 18 months or two years' mm. time. Because the pot at, at the end of that tun tunnel is really big. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars as opposed to the $60 million a year we're getting now. It's just just incredible. The How sweet it would be, yeah. but uh, people have been disappointed many times, so yes. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. That's correct. Ron Penny, thank you very much for your perspective. You're very welcome. Well, there's a move tonight to raise awareness about a form of cancer that we don't often hear about. We have the details from a patient and his doctor after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, as you heard earlier in the Myeloid Leukemia Awareness Day, and if you've never heard of AML before, you're not alone. Dr. Dave Jones and his patient, AML survivor Jeff Penton, are trying to help more people understand what this blood cancer is and what it does. I sat down with both of them earlier today to talk about it. We started with Penton telling us about the first symptoms that led to his diagnosis. It wasn't the bruising, like, you know, if you Google it, you, you see the symptoms of bruising, is bleeding. For me, it was, uh, you know, I, I was training for the upcoming uh, running season, an avid runner, and I, I just couldn't hit the times that I wanted to, and, uh, you know, I chalked it up to the flu, and I, I kind of fought through it, and, and then a month went on, and then when I got into the to week five, week six of feeling like it, then I, I knew something was wrong, but... Uh, you, you know, you just you still chalk it up to to a flu or a virus, and uh, you know that that was my symptoms. Uh, and then I went to the doctor and uh, my family doctor and got blood work ordered, and uh, and basically my blood work come back like uh, Dr. Jones said. You know, just everything was was bottomed out, and uh, uh, two days later I had a, a, a bone marrow biopsy with with uh, Dr. Grewal. Um, and uh, that afternoon he called and said, I had a look under the microscope. Um, you have acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, we're getting a bed ready for you to start chemotherapy tomorrow and prepare to come for weeks. And that was it. I was surprisingly calm. I, I knew what, it, you know, I was obviously very sick. Uh, and it was just, you know, okay, this is what's been given to me. And, and now how do, I, how do I deal with it, really? But no, I didn't know much about 
anything about acute myeloid leukemia. Yeah, and that's a that's a quite common thing that I see is that. Um, you know, people are aware of breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer. You kind of have an idea of what the, those organs do in your body. But if I were to ask you what your immune system does, many people don't know. Um, and essentially, this is a cancer of the immune system, which is usually the white cells in your blood. Um, and those immune system uh, cells can go anywhere. So if you make those cells cancerous, people get quite ill with them. But um, that's one of the main reasons we wanted to do this AML Awareness Day is that people just don't have a really great handle or familiarity uh, on AML or leukemia in general, really. Leukemias are only about 3% of all cancers. So blood cancers represent probably about 10 or 11% of all cancers. Leukemias are about 3%. And then if you break that down even further, AML is about less than 1%. So you don't run into so, so many people with leukemia. Um, but as Jeff sort of alluded to, even though the um, numbers may not be high, what, what, are, what we see our patients go through is, is, is not necessarily more. It's not the case, but it's very intense, you know? And that's yeah. the first thing I asked. It's like I, I was probably the fittest time I ever was in my life. I didn't smoke. I was an avid runner. I, you know, worked out in the gym a bit. And, and it was the first thing I asked the doctor. Was probably the second or third day was why? What did I do? And, and the doctor just looked at me and said, Honestly, it's bad luck. The type of chemo that Jeff received is called myeloblative chemo, and it, it is the most intense chemo that the human body can handle. There's no other stronger chemo. Yeah, so it's pretty it, and it was too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's no beating around the bush. So, yeah. but, uh, so what does that do to you? So the whole idea, see, the, the, the leukemia, these all stem from your bone marrow. So um, leukemia is there, so you need to wipe out your bone marrow. So the whole, and that's the whole idea of a transplant, you get this chemo or radiation therapy uh, to wipe out the bone marrow and hopefully wipe out the leukemia. But then uh, when you get someone else's stem cells, you also get their new immune system. So that immune system grows up inside of you and it mounts an immune response against the leukemia lifelong. So, so in my case, it was, I have one sibling, was my brother, and he had a 25% chance of being a match and he was a perfect match. So I was, I was grateful for that. So he, it's, it's his stem cells, it's his immune system that's in me now, so. That's right. Yeah, really interesting to learn about that. Definitely. A lot I didn't know before, for sure. Um, so Ryan, how is the weather looking for the weekend? Okay, I so want to do some outdoor stuff, uh, please. Some little bit of garden stuff. It, it really it hurts when they when when folks like you say please, <laughs> please, <laughs> and I still really don't have. Go for a drive to the West Coast. Uh, yeah, it's looking a little bit desperate here in the East again this weekend. Uh, we are. Talking about some encouraging signs, though, for next week. In Stokes, you're not looking good. I'm thinking of maybe about a sick day on Monday for you. What do you think? Dr. Snodden <laughs> recommends. Nice. Uh, freezing rain warning in effect for uh, the northeast coast down the southern shore. That will likely uh, be a change to a freezing drizzle warning. At least that's my thinking uh, through this evening as that rain does taper off to some drizzle, which will linger into tomorrow. This is the system we're going to be watching for Sunday. Some uncertainty with this one because there are some snow possibilities with it for the northeast coast into central. This is how it plays out. Note that precip tapering off just to some drizzle overnight into Saturday. But with that northerly flow blowing in off the North Atlantic, the drizzle and freezing drizzle chances do remain through the day on Saturday, anywhere from St. John's into Central. Uh, again, a little bit more in the way of sun towards the West Coast, but I think the clouds even build up here into the afternoon. And Labrador looks generally quiet as well, with plenty of clouds, but temperatures in that seasonal range, zero to three degrees, generally speaking. And again, the warmest spot, the Buren towards the, the West Coast. And so if you're really uh, desperate for some warmer temperatures, jump in the car. If you're at least in the east and northeast where it has been so dreary, Head down to the beer and it will be a nice day there again tomorrow. You folks have been uh, uh, not doing too bad over the last couple of days, especially along that south coast. Now, Sunday, this is the scene. We've got some uh, 
Afternoon flurries rolling into western Labrador. Some coastal flurries for Happy Valley Goose Bay and uh, along the east coast, I should say, Happy Valley Goose Bay will be seeing some sun breaks and uh, no flurries there. Uh, some morning flurries possible in the west. It's flurries or shower possibilities for central and towards eastern Newfoundland. And the system, again, is a little bit of a tricky one. It's going to be coming in from the south. We could see some light accumulation here on the back side of this low from anywhere from Grand Falls, Windsor, down towards the Bonavista Peninsula region, even down towards the Buren, I think will be either way a shower mixed with flurry action for the Avalon. And as we roll into the Monday time period, finally high pressure to our southeast, a bit of a southerly flow coming in here. In fact, a southwesterly flow coming in and ahead of this front, we are looking at Monday to be a beautiful day. Sun and cloud temperatures in that 7, 8, 9, 10 degree range. And yeah, colder air spilling into Labrador behind the system, but it appears that will stay at bay. And you can see uh, while we do cool down a little bit for Tuesday, we'll hang on to the sun and we're flirting with double digits again for Wednesday into Thursday across the island, although a system moving in from the west. But that is a little more what we should be talking about for this time of year uh, in terms of temperatures and yeah, a little bit of bonus sunshine in there as well. Labrador again uh, looking at uh, not a bad weekend, but a bit of a cool down early next week, but some recovery. All aboard. We've got a pretty tough assignment today. We're here in beautiful Petty Harbor, zip lining with North Atlantic zip lines. Ready? Oh yeah. Let's go, brother. Woo! Here now with the owner of North Atlantic Zip Lines, Rob. How are you? Please meet you, Ryan. How you uh, doing? Thanks for having us up. Why don't you just give us a little rundown of uh, how this whole thing came to be? Uh, I lived in the Middle East for eight years and uh, was very fortunate to do a lot of traveling while I was over there. And uh, I saw an operation in Thailand uh, and uh, came up with the idea to, to bring something like this back to Newfoundland. Being from, from St. John's area, Mount Pearl, I flew offshore with Cougar and we did, did a lot of search and rescue uh, in this area. So I know the topography of the land would work well. Uh, a working fishing village, and we're only 10 minutes from downtown St. John's. You know, in the summertime, you can look outside, you can see the whales jumping. In the spring of the year, we got the icebergs. It's a million dollar view. Um, now, 365 or? Oh, we're open all year long. Even on the, the worst day possible in St. John's, we're up there. Nice, I'm looking forward to it. Let's get going. Well, our next line is our longest line is over 2,000 feet, so let's go. Awesome. Just had a bit of lunch, moose stew. Uh, lunch, this is part of the deal, all right? Absolutely, absolutely. Every time we come up, uh, we'll stop and have a, a feed of moose, or it could be a pot of mussels, or uh, hot dogs, whatever people want. We're on the side of a hill here, overlooking Petty Harbor. How did you get all of this up here? <laughs> We're 500 feet above sea level right now, and uh, everything that you see has been brought up here by my employees and people that we work with us uh, on their backs. Um, every on the lines? On the lines, or on their backs. Every tour, somebody comes through here with something. <laughs> I'm to give a shout out to cameraman Mark Cumby, who is doing this entire zip line tour with a camera in his hand. Good boy, Mark! After that thrill, here's another thrill. Our young athlete of the day is Chase Tucker from Catalina. 
chase is off to an early start as a hockey player and a hockey fan. At just four years old, he enjoys hitting the ice with his team, the Bonavista Cadets. Hope you had a great season. Chase, congrats on being today's Young Athlete of the Day. A new study has some alarming news for those who may look to diet soda as a healthy alternative to sugary drinks. The study suggests people who drink one artificially sweetened soda every day had almost three times the risk of stroke and dementia than those who had just one a week. More research is needed to understand exactly why diet soda may be harmful. The study is published in the journal Stroke and looked at a pool of 4,000 people. The hotel chain that owns Holiday Inn has hired a cybersecurity firm to investigate a breach that is much larger than first thought. Hackers stole credit card data from more than a thousand hotels across North America, and the number continues to grow. At least 113 of them are in Canada, with most in Ontario and Alberta. Some are under the names Candlewood Suites, Staybridge Suites, and Crown Plaza. The company is advising cardholders to review their statements and report any unauthorized activity to their card issuer. Heavy rain is causing flooding across Quebec and it could get worse. The town of Rigaud is hardest hit. Nearly 350 homes there are either flooded or surrounded by water. Local leaders have already declared a state of emergency in the library serving as a shelter. But some residents are ignoring the evacuation order and trying to secure their possessions.
Well, a dog is getting the hero treatment after surviving nine days in the wild. Yes, and Joey's owner can't believe he made it out alive. There's eagles, there's foxes, there's wolves, there's big dogs. He survived, and he's only like eight pounds. Oh, it was minus 17 when Joey went missing last week, and he wasn't even wearing his fur-trimmed coat. Oh, he's so little. Oh, but tiny. he was found after an intense search by the community. <laughs> he's now recovering at home with just some minor injuries. Oh, oh that's the coat. Sweet. Some good news there. Hopefully some good news in the game tonight. You ladies have yet to ask me about my blue suit <laughs> it's been for the Leafs. Such a busy program. It's been a busy show also. Uh, oh. blue, so blue socks. Uh, so we're really going for a game five here tonight. Oh, uh, they've got to win now. Yeah, they really do. Uh, perfect in Parsons Pond. We'll leave you this uh, viewer picture of the day. Uh, did I show too much leg? I'm sorry. I showed some ankle. Uh, uh, Ruby uh, sent this picture in, and it's perfect uh, for Parsons Pond, uh, where the weather has been beautiful over the last couple of days. Oh, it's a gorgeous shot. Thanks, mm -hmm. Ruby. Uh, time now to have a look at some other pictures. Who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week? Pat and Marilyn Purcell will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations. Birthday greetings to Clara Reed of Bishop's Falls, who celebrated her 92nd birthday last Saturday. Happy 57th anniversary this week to Susie and Bud Rose of Hermitage. Happy 58th wedding anniversary to Harold and Edna Kinsla of Whiteway. It's a golden anniversary tomorrow for Donald and Melita Delaney, previously of Portabasque, now in Stephenville. Happy 50th wedding anniversary as well to Harry and Carrie Upshaw of Bain Harbor, formerly of Harbor Buffett, whose special day was yesterday. Happy anniversary to Melvin and Evelyn Roberts of Twillingate on their 54th wedding anniversary. Birthday wishes to Sarah Hatcher of Winter House Brook, Bon Bay, who turned 98 years old this week. Happy 90th birthday to Virtu Virtue Peril of Sandy Cove. Happy birthday to Joseph Masters of Red Harbor, who will celebrate his 94th birthday tomorrow. Happy 50th anniversary to Joe and Marie Vaders of Glenwood, whose special day is today. Happy birthday to Cyril Pope, formerly of Stones Cove, Fortune Bay, who is 91 years old. Happy 96th birthday today to Maggie Keats. Happy 97th birthday to Clara Rideout, formerly of Cormac, currently in Springdale. Congratulations to Art and Liz Symes from Fortune on their 57th anniversary. Happy 67th wedding anniversary this week to Clarence and Effie Smith of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy anniversary to Wilfred and Francis Lemoyne from Rose Blanche, celebrating 53 years of marriage. Happy 52nd anniversary next week to Rita and Nigel Watson of Stephenville. Happy birthday to Alice Martin, who will celebrate her 95th birthday next Tuesday. Ms. Martin is from Pooch Cove, now lives in St. John's. Congratulations to Gordon and Reby Fifield on their 59th wedding anniversary. Happy 90th birthday today to Bertha Crocker, who lives in St. John's. Anniversary greetings to Merrill and Mona Goodyear of Deer Lake, who are celebrating their 59th. Amazing birthday to share with you. Sister Barbara Tobin of the Presentation Sisters is celebrating her 106th birthday today. Happy 56th anniversary to Elwood and Neela Tucker of Meadows. Congratulations to James and Margaret, Margaret Squires of Burlington, who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. Birthday greetings going out to Jane Walsh from Firm News, now in St. John's. Ms. Walsh is celebrating her 95th birthday this Sunday. Happy 50th anniversary to Willie and Hazel Brenton of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 54th anniversary to Amador and Marina Neal of Cornerbrook. 54th wedding anniversary wishes as well to Walter and Audrey Jenkins of Grand Falls, Windsor, celebrating tomorrow. Best wishes to Bob and Isabel George of St. John's, who will be celebrating their 57th anniversary tomorrow. 
Anniversary greetings to Irene and Clifton Loader of Summerside Bay of Islands, who will celebrate their 71st on the 24th. Happy 52nd anniversary to Ivan and Katie Greening, living in Terra Nova. Wishing Evelyn Healy a happy 97th birthday on the 24th. Happy 50th anniversary to Dorothy and Thomas King of St. Louis, Labrador on Monday. Happy birthday to Bride Dillon of St. John's celebrating her 90th birthday this Sunday. And it's a happy 94th birthday tomorrow for Florence, Flora rather, Thomas in Deer Lake. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Pauline and Malcolm Fudge of Deer Lake. Ruby and Gerald George celebrated 56 years of marriage yesterday. And Malcolm and Florence Single were married 54 years ago Wednesday. And one final greeting this evening, Harvey and Audrey Reed of Bain Harbor will celebrate their 55th wedding anniversary on April 23rd. Congratulations once again. And Ryan, I'm getting some rude inquiries here about the color of your underwear. <laughs> the socks are blue, the suit is blue, and it all matches. <laughs> He's dedicated. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I hope all it, in. I <laughs> hope it all luck. goes your way tonight. Me too. I'm and out of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great weekend. Good night.